Father, we thank you, Father, for a beautiful day, a day in your home among your people, a day, Father, in which we can praise your name, lift up our requests, and learn at your feet. So we ask, Father, that now as we turn our attention to study, that what we choose to hear, Father, will be what you choose to teach and not something of our own making. What we choose to do with it, Father, will be what the Spirit convicts us of, and we will not be just hearers of the Word. And that in all these things that we learn and do and, and say and, and feel, Father, all of these things would be working toward the good that you have intended, that we would become more Christ-like, greater and better servants of you, better witnesses to the truth of the gospel. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it may be the most obvious statement I'll make in the course of this study, but sin changed the world. And we've seen that now. We've seen that through the course of the first three chapters of Genesis. And now in the first half of chapter 4, we've witnessed how it changed the nature of people. The last time we were in this study, we saw Cain and Abel, a brother against another brother. And from just the earliest stages of humanity, from that first generation after Adam and woman, after Adam and Eve, sin is so evident that it has come upon the world in a powerful way, leading to murder in the very first generation. Humanity didn't work itself up to something evil. Sin starts small and grows. Well, that's true. It can do that, but it doesn't have to do that. It can begin with murder. And in so doing, it demonstrates that sin has changed the very nature of men and has made them something very different from who God made them to be. But smaller sins were also present. If you've been looking at the text with me over the last couple of weeks as we studied in chapter 4, you've noticed other sin besides the big one, besides the murder of Cain, or murder of Abel by Cain. You've noticed the sin of pride in Cain's attitude, of boasting, of lying, of jealousy, of anger, of impatience, of rudeness even. Small things, big things, all kinds of things. And all of these characteristics of sin and and others that will be evident throughout the, the text of Genesis, they all began because of a decision that man made in the garden. And, of course, these sins are present today. I remember a story of a sunny afternoon, a lot like this, when two boys who leave the church from the service that morning and go out decide to hit the streets and go door to door in their neighborhood and knock on doors, offering an explanation of the gospel and inviting people to come to church. And they knock on one door, and it's evident right from the beginning as this older lady opens the door that she was not happy to see them, her sin on full display, and she in no uncertain terms tells these two young men she isn't interested in what they have to say, she certainly isn't interested in going to church. And just to prove her point, she takes the door and with all her strength slams it in their face. But to her surprise, the door doesn't shut. In fact, it bounces back open, leaving the two boys there just staring at her and no expression on their face. And now she's a little perturbed, so she's going to make the point a second time even more forcefully and now puts her back into it and really goes at it and throws all her weight into it, slamming the door, and it bounces open again. Now, at this point, she's convinced they're sticking their foot in the door, and that's made her really mad. And so she's going to show them once and for all that if you put your foot in my door, it's going to hurt. And as she's rearing back to do once again another of these hard pushes of the door, the the young men meekly say, ma'am, before you do that, you might want to move your cat. (laughs) That would have been a better ending. I just get them the way they come. It said cat. (laughs) I'm sorry I missed that. That would have been better. Poodle. Next time, poodle. All right, so the sin of that woman on clear display, and in our own lives as well, we see it every day. Let's go back into the story as we've remembered it from last last time. We were at about verse 16 of chapter 4. Cain has received his banishment. That was, again, to wander, to spend his days away from the presence of God. And if you remember, that was a picture of how all men in sin experience a similar kind of fate away from the presence of God. And in Cain's case, he's also away from his family connections. Look where he goes next, verse 16. Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain had relations with his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city Enoch after the name of his son. Now to Enoch was born Arad, and Arad became the father of Mahujael. And Mahujael became the father of Methusael, and Methusael became the father of Lamech. 
the last time we were here, I covered some of these verses, so I'm not going to repeat them all in length. Here's what we remember from last time. We remember that he goes east because in Scripture, east is a picture of sin, of unrighteousness, of the enemy. Now, I am not saying he didn't actually go east. There is the literal truth that he went to the east. What I'm saying, though, of course, is that in the fact that God prompted him to make this movement, it was meant to also communicate that east is the place of the evil one, of sin, compared to west, the promised land, the place that you go in redemption. He lands up in a place called Nod. Now, remembering that we're at the very early stages of humanity, we would start to ask obvious questions like, where does this town come from? If he's only been around for a short time, how could there be another city? Well, the answer is this city of Nod is likely being founded by Cain, but he's bringing a fairly large family with him. These are people living very, very, very long lives, and there's no dates given as to when these events of Cain and Abel or this event of Cain being banished, when these things take place. We know from later in this chapter and into chapter 5 that Adam is 130 years old when they have the boy that replaces Abel, when they have Seth. So it could be the case that the time between the death of Abel and the birth of Seth is relatively short. If that were true, then we'd be saying this event is happening a good hundred plus years after men had left the garden. Well, without death on the world yet, natural death is yet to start taking hold, Men could have easily married, reproduced, married, reproduced over several generations and put quite a few people into the world in a short period of time. That would be a logical assumption. And so he's establishing this place, this land of Nod. The word Nod, by the way, is similar to the word Nud in Hebrew, which means wander. So he may have named it after his own condition of wandering. We already covered the wife issue last time as well. Verse 17 We discussed how this could happen, that it would be Cain's sister or a niece, maybe, someone in the family that was available for a marriage, and that we could see it as acceptable in Cain's day while no longer acceptable today based on a couple of things. First, that God's law has changed since this day. It was necessary in this day, but it was no longer necessary after a point in time. And so God withdrew this opportunity in his law. Secondly, we don't see it as healthy any longer because the DNA defects that are in everybody's body, have reached the point now where intermarrying in the family is going to produce a very problematic child in most cases. Defects are going to show up in that child, and so we don't want to see that happen. But in this day, the DNA was yet almost perfect, and so there was no issue. There was no likely negative outcome for having a man marry his sister or his close relative. Let's look at his son. In the text, it says his first son is Enoch. Now, the name means something very interesting. His name means being dedicated to God or being sacred, in other words. Isn't that ironic? I mean, we think about Cain, we think about his family here. Here's a man who himself is an unbeliever. Cain is a man who does not know the Lord in faith. That's why he's been cursed and banished. And yet he's calling his son here a name that means sacred, as in set apart for God. It's a classic display of superficial attempts to connect to God through works. This is, this is what men have been doing since this day. It's ironic, of course, because why would someone who's rejected God's authority care to identify his son with God? What's the point? Why put up the charade? Who cares? But this is exactly what the unbelieving world does. And really, to some extent, it's what all of us did before we came to faith, particularly if we came to faith as an adult where we may have had some years as adults before faith. If we are honest with ourselves, if we look back into that stage of our life, we may have been either oblivious to religion and God in general, living entirely without any concern for that, but most people let some measure of religion seep into their life. Very few people, in my experience, are completely devoid of spiritual interests of any kind. And whatever we let seep in, whatever religion comes into our lifestyle and into the way we behave, it's exactly this kind, this kind of thinking that you see on display here with Cain naming his son Enoch. It's man's attempt. I've heard it defined this way, and I think it makes good sense. Religion is man's attempt to reach to God. But grace is God's way of reaching men. Because our efforts to reach up go nowhere. God alone can reach down and find us. So unless God reveals himself to an individual, the only option left 
to the one who is unbelieving and living a life in disobedience, the only option they have left is to pretend. You know how kids, when they're small, play cops and robbers, play doctor, play this, play that? Well, in adult life, among the unbelieving world, the religion that dominates the world, the spiritual activities that you see everywhere around you among unbelievers, are adults playing religion. They've taken what they lack, that is, that God-sized hole in their heart that recognizes they have a need for something, and they're stuffing things in it, filling their own need on a constant basis, superficially, falsely, and through works. And none of it achieves anything from God's point of view. It is merely for show. That's why the writer of Hebrews can say, without faith, it is impossible to please God. He's referencing this very kind of behavior, the attempt that people have to reach out to God without the faith requirement that God himself says is the only way. Faith in his word. Jude, in his letter, his short letter, describes unbelievers who think that they themselves are spiritual men and have some connection to God. He actually has a term for that kind of person, very interesting term in the letter of Jude. He calls them men who are gone the way of Cain. Men who think themselves spiritual, but have a false understanding of that spirituality and have no connection to God at all, he calls them men who have gone the way of Cain. He also says they've gone the way of Balaam. It means opposing God's law, seeking your own righteousness through your works, and substituting man-made religion for true relationship. Friends, I'm speaking about what unbelievers do, and it helps us, I think, to see that for what it is, so that when we encounter those in our life who don't know the Lord, but are very religious... We have a point of reference from which to understand why they do what they do. But there's another side to this that I don't want to leave unspoken for the sake of the believer. There is a potential trap for the believer in becoming something like Cain in this sense. We can sometimes adopt practices that are religious attempts to reach God, but are not done in faith. We can begin to slip into doing very much the same thing if we're not careful. In a context like this, well-meaning people like me or elders or others can begin to ask things of you that have no bearing out of Scripture. And though that doesn't mean they're automatically wrong, sometimes we make rules about how to conduct the service and they're for the sake of order and for the sake of keeping things running smoothly. And so we ask people to follow suit in these rules or requirements. We don't say they're biblically required. We're not making them a a litmus test for faith. We're just saying, hey, this is helpful. Can you help us do these things? That's fine. But be careful that none of them cross a line in your mind and become the essentials. That somehow, for example, being in this building every Sunday suddenly becomes the essential to being a Christian. That's not true. And I'm here every Sunday, but I'm telling you that's not true. We come here because we want to, because this is where God has given us an opportunity to do things we want to do in praise to his name. But they are not obligations. Similarly, you're not supposed to pray certain ways. You're not supposed to to wear certain clothing per se. There are a lot of things we start to attach to what it means to be a Christian that have nothing to do with being a Christian. And though some of those rules are helpful at times, that's not the same thing as saying they're requirements from God. What Cain is doing here is, without a faith, without a relationship, he's creating his own requirements so that he feels like he's checking boxes. And let me tell you, folks, in my experience, there is no group of people I've ever met on earth who are better at checking boxes than Christians when they feel like they're supposed to. We're very obedient. We're very compliant people, generally. Don't let that turn into your religion. Notice all these names in the story. We have Mahujael, a smitten of God. We have Methusael, his name means man of God. All these claims to a relationship with God that are not actually relationships to God, we know this is Cain's line. This is not the line God uses to reveal himself through to the Messiah. This is the ungodly line of Cain. And yet all these men carry these very religious sounding names. Then it ends with a man called Lamech. Now if you count from Adam, Lamech is the seventh down the line of Cain. Now, seven suggests something, doesn't it? Seven suggests the culmination, the perfection, the completing of something. That's how God uses the number seven. In this case, it means the completing of the corruption of sin. You'll notice this is the last man in Cain's line that we see mentioned anywhere in Scripture. In fact, at the end of chapter four, we cease any mention of Cain 
in the lines of men going through the rest of Genesis. This is the end of his story. And it ends with the seventh man, Lamech. Look what we hear about this man. Verse 19. Lamech took to himself two wives. The name of one was Adah and the name of the other was Zilhah. Adah gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. As for Zillah, she also gave birth to Tubal Cain, the forger of all implements of bronze and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Naamal. Well, let's look at a few of these names and what's going on here. Lamech, as I said, is the seventh. His name means warrior. Warrior. And he takes two wives. Here we have the first recorded incident of bigamy, taking more than one wife, in other words, in Scripture. Notice who pioneers this wonderful concept. It's the seventh in the line of Cain, Lamech, the one who is perfecting corruption. For those who would come to Scripture and, for example, using this story, say that, well, multiple wives go all the way back to the beginning of time. Clearly, this is something God intended. After all, men like Abraham had multiple wives. Men like Solomon had multiple wives. We cannot say that the Bible does not allow multiple wives. Well, when you see the concept introduced in Scripture, take note of where it comes from. God here in the Scriptures is recording the event so that we would know about it. And if our eyes are open, we notice the one who came up with the idea is the seventh in the line of Cain, the perfected, corrupted man. The fact that God records it is so that we might understand its origin. And in understanding where it came from, understand what we should think about it. If Cain's line invented something, generally speaking, it should be a dubious thing in our minds, particularly when we know that Scripture specifically speaks against something like bigamy when it describes marriage as the combining of one man and one woman. The fact that God records it doesn't mean he endorses it. You only have to look as far as a few obvious stories out of the Old Testament to know that's true. My favorite is David and Bathsheba. Does the fact that God records his sin with that woman endorse adultery? Who would argue that? Hopefully none of us. Similarly, the fact that he's recording that men like Abraham or Solomon married multiple wives, is that a a way of God endorsing it or merely God recording the sin of men when it occurred in their lives? Uh, Having our eyes open as we study Scripture will help us make the right determination concerning those things. By the way, I've always said the concept of adding another wife, I don't understand that myself. One is great and more than I can handle. I don't understand the thinking that says, you know, another one of these would be great. To my way of thinking, I I haven't figured out how to be good enough for the one one I have. Adah means adorned, as in outward appearance, adorned. But there's an implication in the language that she is the wife he married for childbearing purposes. The woman they named Zilha, it means to grow or to be dark, but it has a connotation of sexual pleasure. So the implication is he married one woman to have babies and he married the other woman for fun. And that was his concept. That was his division, if you will, between the two women. You can immediately begin to see how sin is at the core of this decision and how it would be detrimental to good relationships. Now, she gives birth to first, the dog gives birth to Jabal, and here's where you see a couple of interesting additions to the his, historical record. He is the man, we're told, began the tradition of the nomadic lifestyle, which is very common even now in the East, a style of shepherding and moving around. Now, we already heard earlier that Abel was a man who kept flocks. What's different here is the style in which he did it. He moves around on a continual basis nomadically with his flocks. That was something new. That's in keeping with Cain's family lifestyle, wandering. Then his brother, Jubal, is the first man to explore the concept of music and musical instruments as a a new way of expression. The other brother from the other wife, his name Tubal Cain, he is the man who develops forging of metal into instruments of one kind or another, tools and the like. Now let's think about this for a minute, what's going on with this line. We already understand Cain's line is a line in which we see rebellion from God and distancing from God. And from Lamech you have these men now listed who develop fundamental technologies of everyday life. Technologies that we know today give us great opportunity. Musical instruments, for example. 
These are accomplishments that we know gain benefits for us even to today. We use music today in this service. We wouldn't certainly look to the music today, as wonderful as it was, and say, well, that's evil. We shouldn't be doing that. That's not a biblical point of view. Even in the Old Testament, we see evidence of men singing and praise and musical instruments being used. But why then is it associated with Cain's line? What is the meaning or the implication of seeing these important accomplishments, these technological advances originating out of a line that is ungodly? First of all, when's the last time you went to a movie and enjoyed it? My guess is most of the people who worked on that movie were unbelievers. When's the last time you read a good fiction book written probably by an unbeliever? When's the last time you enjoyed a good meal, probably cooked by someone who wasn't a believer? And my point is the world is filled with people and the vast majority of them don't know the Lord. And yet, as Scripture says, he brings rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. There's a measure of grace that God has poured out on the world as a whole that influences the world as a whole. And it's not limited to the believing realm. We see that every day. We, we take that for granted. The policeman who comes and saves your life in some moment of distress, may not be a believer, but you'll take his help anyway, won't you? (laughs) And similarly, at this early stage, God is showing grace at least to a measure, even in the lives of unbelievers, because he is using their work and their talents to glorify his name, even though they themselves don't personally glorify his name. That's the first thing to remember. The second thing to remember is these things are amoral. There's immoral, there's moral, But then there's also amoral. Immoral means bad. Moral means good. Amoral means no relationship to good or bad without relationship to morality. These things are amoral. A musical instrument is amoral. It has no inherent morality one way or the other. Similarly, forging a tool out of metal is not inherently good or bad. It's amoral. So these are amoral issues. God is bringing them into the world through these men. But how are they influencing this line? That's the more fundamental question. These things would give you everything you want in life. They begin to build a cocoon around people who don't know the Lord that allows them to remain all the more independent of Him. They give power and influence and intelligence and culture to people. And these men take what they know, how to make tools and and warring implements, how to make music, and they start using these things to separate themselves more and more and more from God. Do you not see this in the culture? What do you see among people who don't know the Lord and have no interest in Him and no spiritual dimension to their life? They're busy people. They're working hard. Most of them have a very full life. They spend a lot of time in sports. They spend a lot of time in the arts. They spend a lot of time in entertainment areas of of life. They are engaged in intellectual pursuits of one kind or another. They sit in their garage and work on their car. They do whatever they need to to fill their days, don't they? What's enabling all of that independence and isolation from God? A world full of stuff. Engaging stuff. Helpful stuff. Useful stuff. It's still stuff. It's materialism or it's busyness. The shame of it is when it comes to rest in the home of a Christian family. When a Christian family gets so wrapped up in the lifestyle of the world, which has a certain pattern to it, it goes with the ages of your kids. At least that's what I've seen in my life. When they're really young, it's soccer. When they're a little older, it's all the leagues and the teams and the clubs. And and when they're in the college, then it's about working hard to pay for college. And then when they're out of college, it's trying to help them get a life started and fix all their problems. And it's Or it's the job. Go to school, get the master's degree, climb the ladder, be there the extra hours so that you can impress the boss. Then you get the big job. Now you really got to be there all the time because they're the ones who depend on you. Or it's the hobbies, showing their dog at dog shows or gardening. These aren't bad things. These are amoral things. You can do all of them if you want. There's nothing wrong with anything I just said except when it becomes what it did for Cain's line, a means of supporting independence from God a cocoon, an isolation from who God is, so that we don't have to talk to Him very often. We don't have to think about Him very often. We don't have to turn to Him very often. Why? Because we got a full life. We seem very satisfied with what we have. Do you know what God does? The God who loves us and knows us and called us by name and has saved us by grace, do you know what He does when we do that? He breaks through. Do you know how He breaks through? He makes things stop working. The things we poured our life into fall apart. The career, the hobbies, the house that we kept so nice, the yard that we always 
took care of, whatever it is. The people we invested our time in, He breaks things. And He does it so that He can talk to us and so that we aren't dependent on these other things. And it's not always a, a crystal clear understanding. I don't mean to make it sound trivial. There's a lot of complicated things that happen to, in life and they trace to a lot of different things. They don't come down to just one cause necessarily but i've said this before to other people it's funny this example was on my mind today and here look what god did just amazing but the example i give is literally this is my example you're on the road and your car breaks down instead of getting mad on the side of the road at why your car breaks down you're supposed to say to yourself why did god want me to stop here why did he need me to have this experience today you know, I'm going to have several things happen throughout the afternoon to get this thing fixed and to get back on the road. And they're going to bring me into contact with people I may not have had contact with. And they're going to give me opportunity to test my patience or whatever. I don't know. The point is, there's an outlook that comes with an understanding that God just broke through my day. I had a plan. It was going to take a certain direction. It was going to finish in a certain way. And God just said, break through that, Steve. You've got a different plan. Guess what? I'm going to spend some time with you today in a way you never expected. And he'll do it through marital conflict or he'll do it through children's dilemmas or he'll do it through a work problem in terms of your job or he'll do it through health issues. But he will break through because the more important thing to God is our relationship with him than our achievements in this life. And Cain, Cain is the beginning of this. A man who is away from God's presence, banished from God and cursed, spending his life wandering. And now, what do you fill the gap of God with? Music, art, farming. Not bad things, but they're bad because of how they became wall of separation. How they cemented that distance, that independence that he had. For believer, the advancements of our world can be an opportunity to serve and to glorify God. But they can also be distractions. Verse 23, Lamech says to his wives here, Ada, Zillah, listen to my voice, you wives of Lamech. Give heed to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me and a boy for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech, seventy-sevenfold. This is the oldest recorded poetry in the Bible. And it is poetry. We don't see it as such perhaps because in our mind, or in the way we hear poetry, we look for rhyme and a certain pattern of, of speech a certain kind of of lyric pattern. But Hebrew poetry doesn't work on that basis. To the Eastern ear, what they look for is parallelism and repetition. Parallelism and repetition is their form of poetry. So you look in, for example, verse 23. You see, Lamech says to his wives, Adela and Zilha, listen to my voice. And then it's repeating itself with a parallel way of saying it. You wives of Lamech, give heed to my speech. Same thing said twice in a parallel way. That's poetry to the Hebrew ear. Then Lamech says to his wives, he gives them the news, he says, I have killed a man. He boasts, I have killed a man. We don't see the details of the event, and in this big picture of what we're seeing here, it doesn't really matter why or how he did it. The point is he is boasting about doing it. And by the way, if you think he killed two men, you're missing the Hebrew poetry again. It's repetition. He says, I have killed a man, I have killed a young man. He's simply saying one guy, describing him twice. That's how Hebrew poetry works. What is he making this point for? Why does this show up in the story of Lamech? Well, the point of the poem is he's boasting in his defiance against God. Or more accurately, he is claiming an equality with God. He's trying to put himself on equal footing with God. And look how he does this. Number one, everyone knows Cain's history in that day, his family, the people who descended from Adam, who lived on the earth. Everyone knows Cain. Cain was the guy who murdered his brother. And from what we can tell in the record of Scripture, it's still, at this point, the only death that's ever happened. So everyone knows this guy, Cain. He's the guy that took another man's life. Now, they also knew what God had said about that event. When God banished Cain, He made clear that Cain's life would not be threatened because if anyone were to take Cain's life, God personally would avenge that killing, avenge Cain's own life, in other words, against whoever came against Cain. So Cain could go around knowing he was safe to some degree because no one would dare kill him because if they did, God would step in and and respond. Lamech seems determined now to improve on Cain's reputation for his own sake. It's the sin of pride. He says, number one, 
I've killed a man too. You see, it's not just Cain now. I've got that same reputation. I'm a killer. But he boasts about that. And then he says he did it for retaliation purposes. Somebody wounded him. Somebody attacked him. Maybe somebody tried to steal something from Lamech. We don't know. But in response to that attack, Lamech ups the ante. He doesn't just defend himself. He doesn't just push the attacker away. He goes to the next step and murders, takes the life of this person that tried to hurt him. He makes it very clear. This was an act in which he went beyond what was necessary. And then he says, if attacking Cain was going to bring God's vengeance, now Lamech says, if you attack me, you've got to deal with my vengeance. He puts himself above God in that 77-fold reference. He puts himself above God. This is what he's saying. If you attack Cain, you had to deal with God's sevenfold vengeance. But if you attack Lamech, you'll have to deal with 77-fold vengeance, that being my own. He's clearly making himself to be greater than God, if that were possible. The corruption of Cain's line here is shining through. You have Lamech, who is a man of flesh and sin nature, on full display. And his flesh is not satisfied, and it seeks everything it wants. We've got a two-wife marriage. And then he says, if anyone tries to take advantage against me, I will kill them and avenge myself to an even greater degree than God can avenge Cain. And now, the cherry on the top, he boasts about it to his wives. When Cain's sin was discovered, he mourned for the outcome of his own safety. Remember that? I'm not saying he was a believer. We've already covered that trail. But he was repentant in the worldly sense. He was sorry he got caught. He was sorry he was going to have consequences. Now look how we've gone seven men down the line from Adam. Here we have the full expression of sin. Not only does he do what Cain did and worse, but he's not sorry about it in the least. In fact, he boasts about it. Does that not reflect the world? When you see men or women at their worst, they're sinful and they're unrepentant and they're proud of it. They enjoy showing off how bad they can be. We see it in little kids all the time. It's been there from the beginning. Lamech is the quintessential sinful man in rebellion from God. He's a poster child here for the power of sin and corruption. Now, I want to put him aside as we finish today and just look at the other side of the coin just for a minute as Scripture allows here at the very end of the chapter. In contrast to the seventh man from the line through Cain, the man who completes corruption and becomes this poster child of what it means to be sin. What do you have on the other side? Look at verse 25. Adam had relations with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth. For she said, God has appointed me another offspring in place of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth, to him also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. So when Adam was 130, and we learned this from chapter 5, but when Adam was 130, he finally has another son. It would seem from the text that this may be the first son he's had since Abel died. Now, chapter 5 tells us he had other sons and daughters. But from how it's approached here, it would, just, it would seem to suggest that now they get another son. Maybe they've been having daughters for a while. It almost hearkens to Sarah and Abraham, doesn't it? The thought that they lost the son, the one that they assumed would be the line from which the Messiah would come, and yet it was cut short, and now they've been in waiting mode for the next one to come along. And maybe they've had daughters along the way. And then finally, woman says, Eve says, God has appointed me another offspring. The name Seth actually means appointed one, in keeping with her recognition that this is the replacement for the line of Abel, the man God intends to bring a seed into the world through. This is the line that goes to the Messiah. In fact, you're going to notice this is the entire theme of the book of Genesis. Who is the line and how is God preserving the seed that he promised when he said what he said in the garden? The whole book of Genesis is directed toward how is God keeping that promise through a line, through a seed. Seth, we're told, gives birth here to a son, Enosh. Now, the name Enosh is interesting. It means fragile. It means frail. Contrast that with the other line. You have these two family trees. On the one hand, you have these men of boastful, sinful pride, calling themselves man of God and then telling the world that they're greater than God. On the other hand, you have Seth, 
the appointed one, or the, the one that God appointed, giving birth to a son and then calling him frail, fragile. It remem- reminds me of Jesus saying, the meek shall inherit the earth. That those who understand their, their true position before God are the ones who have faith working in their heart. You can see this name repeated, actually, interestingly, in Psalm 103. In Psalm 103, verse 15, listen to this. It says, As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. Well, the word for man there, as for man, the word man is Enosh in Hebrew. As for man, or as for a frail man. And then we're told that at this point, men begin to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, this is an interesting phrase. Let me make sure you understand what he's saying, what Moses is saying. In Hebrew, this does not mean that men before Enosh, men like Adam or Seth, his father, that they were not believers or that they were not approaching God, either in prayer or in some other fashion. It's specifically a reference to public worship. What he's saying is, now... Public worship has been invented. While Cain's line is responsible for musical instruments and implements of war or technology, what do we have to attribute to God's line through Seth? What's their accomplishment? What did they invent? Public displays of adoration for God. What a stark difference. One side trusts and depends on themselves. The other side says, our main point in life is to worship God. That's why we exist, to give him glory. A final note concerning chapters 1 through 4 of Genesis so we may end today and go into communion. Bible critics, particularly since the late 19th century, have enjoyed tearing down the truth of Scripture. This is among men whose faith in Scripture is, is absent, that they see it as a work that was written without inspiration, filled with stories and myth. When that practice of biblical criticism became popular in the late 19th century. These first four chapters of Genesis was a place men quickly ran to demonstrate their superior knowledge about the source of Scripture. And they quickly ran into these chapters to illustrate that these could not have been written by just one man, Moses. They were likely written by many different people and stitched together over centuries as myth took hold and different ideas formed. And what we have today is little more than just this amalgamation, this patchwork combination of different stories and myth and that it's not truly Scripture. In response to that, I want you to take note of a few facts we see in just the first four chapters of Genesis. The name Abel appears seven times. The name Cain appears 14 times, twice seven. All the names listed in Cain's family, including his parents and sisters, total 14, twice seven. The word name appears seven times. The word land is found seven times. The word field is found seven times. The word ground is found seven times. The combined usage of the words Jehovah and God appear 35 times, which is five times seven. In chapters one through five, the combined usage of Jehovah and God is 70 times, 10 times seven. And there are more like that. The point is, you can believe those are coincidental, or you can believe there is a divine inspiration behind these words such that there are fingerprints, there are clues on the text, even at that level, to reaffirm for us that this source is not a patchwork of men making stories up. But it is the literal truth of God presented to us by the hand of Moses who was inspired to write what he wrote. Clearly the book is divinely inspired and authored. Let's go to prayer and then go to a time of communion. Heavenly Father, We look at Scripture on a regular basis so that you may instruct us concerning not only the way that you have done your work and the nature and the the perfection of your character, but, Father, we know that Scripture is also intended to be a mirror in which, as you reveal things to our heart, we see ourselves in a new and better way. And I ask, Father, that as we studied today, that what you saw, what you presented and what we saw would be a useful mirror, one that could reflected to us our own sin, our own errors, our own limitations. But at the same time, Father, would direct us toward you and toward your grace and your mercy so that we might not simply be uh, weighed down by the knowledge and and the recognition of our sin, but we would run to you and understand that in grace, Father, you lift us up. That to the one who is humble, to the one who is meek, 
to the one who understands the power of sin and knows that a Savior is necessary. I pray, Father, you would direct that heart to yourself and and to those who know you, Father, you would strengthen our hearts and cause us to walk in a greater faith. And, Father, I do pray that as we make decisions every day about our time and our attention and our efforts and our energies, our hopes and dreams, that while we may enjoy the things this world offers, we would never let them become a distraction from serving you. That when you decide to break through in our life and speak to us, we would stop and listen. We thank you, Father, that you are God who does not forsake and does not forget and does not leave us. And like a good father, you will discipline. Thank you, Father, for a church that preaches your word, that cares to hear it and makes it a priority. And, Father, I pray as we go into the time in which we will eat next door that you will bless our time there as well. Bless the food, Father, as we give it over to you and ask that it would work in our bodies to nourish and strengthen us. And we ask, Father, our fellowship would be a glory and an honor to your name as well. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.